Time to begin this morning. If you'll please turn your songbooks to number 71. We'll begin there. Number 71. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a Number 708, it'll be a song after our announcements and prayer, please. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the services here at the Monticello Church of Christ. Got a nice big crowd today. It's good to see everyone out. We are also excited for anyone who might be listening in by way of our local radio station, or if you're tuning in by way of Facebook or YouTube, if you're tuning in and would like to come and be with us, there's nothing that would please us more. We're located on Highway 90 as if you were going towards Somerset just at the city limits. We have our main worship service on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. We have a Bible study immediately following that around, we'll say, 10, 15. And on Wednesday evenings, we get together for a Bible study at 7, so every chance you get, uh, we would encourage you to come and learn more about the Lord, join us in fellowship and in love, and uh, learn the things that the Lord would want you to learn to be a, a, be a better service to Him. Those on our prayer list this morning, from our church family, Dennis and Charlotte Walker, Sherry Allen, Brenda Daniels, family and friends, Bobby and Mary Burke, Jeff Parmley, Gladys Dennis, Teresa Davis, Rowena Branscom, Sandy Montgomery, Alan Frost, Mark Kuntz, uh, Donna Sloan, Tanner San Juan, Charles Ward, Claude McCart, Elijah Neal, Tanya Worley, Vivian McGronigal, Mildred Grist, uh, Gregory, Christy Crouch, Billy Bertram, uh, Melina Orquez, Pat Crosby, Gladys uh, Thompson, Tim Powles, Evan Hayes, Joshua Miller, Jewel McQuarrie, Glendale Perkins, and Jean and Sue Peavy. I was also asked to uh, add some others, uh, Edward Bird and Eric uh, Griffiths. These two, if I wrote it down right, are having health problems and uh, was asked to add to the list, along with Vernon Combs, who uh, has cancer, and his wife Peggy, 
has also struggled with cancer, but she recently fell and uh, injured her shoulder, so I was asked to add them to the list. Uh, those serving in the military, uh, Chris White, Jacob Costello, Michaela Gooch, and Austin Crabtree. One announcement today, after our services and our Bible class, about 1130, we'll be gathering up at a, a Tim Umble's building. It's there, if you know where the Old Cumberland Green or the BP is, if you are pulling out of our driveway and turn right, it's about a three quarters of a mile up here on the left, and his building's just behind that. Uh, we'd love to see you there. We're celebrating uh, the graduation of two seniors that attend here with us, Gavin Coger and Lindsey Branscombe. And uh, Lindsey and her family, uh, her dad and her mom is here with us this morning, uh, Travis and Lacey. And uh, they're fairly new to us, but we're glad to uh, honor them too. I got to say, we're a little bit selfish in uh, asking you all to be a part of this because we want to show you our love and we hope that uh, this will be an encouragement to you and that you'll come and stay and worship with us on and on. So uh, we would be glad to have you. Gavin's been with us for quite a while uh, since he was a, a little feller, and now he's maybe the biggest feller here, but he's graduating too, so I don't know what they, what they feed these kids these days, but they, they grow big. Now, you should bring your own sack lunch today, um, run through the drive through or go home and fix you a, a bologna sandwich and come back up and be with us. A dessert and water will be provided. And we hope everyone makes an effort to attend and, and to support these uh, fine young people as they cross this important threshold and move toward the next phase of their life. Uh, at the bottom of our uh, bulletin here, it says Sherry Allen got to come home this past Thursday. And it says Mary Burke was flown to UK due to dialysis complications and loss of blood. She's undergoing transfusions, and the vascular team will be trying to make decisions regarding her complications with her fistula, and I hope I pronounced that right. Prayers for her and her husband and all the family uh, as, we, as uh, they undergo their care. And I understand that there's not been a whole lot changed on that front since uh, the bulletins were drawn up. So certainly in need of prayers. Those overseeing the services today... Curtis is leading our singing, and as he announced, 708 will be the next song. We'll sing that after the uh, opening prayer, which will happen just after the announcements. That'll be worded by Brother Anthony Vaughn. Uh, after the prayer and the song, Brother Raymond is going to deliver us another fantastic lesson. We are uh, hoping the Lord will be with him, and he'll have a good remembrance of what he's put together, and will really uh, get us excited today to, to serve the Lord. Prayers for the Lord's Supper will be worded by Brother Dale Reagan, and the closing prayer will be worded by Brother Jim Norick. I think I've covered everything on my list, so uh, with that in mind, make sure you got your books marked as 708. We'll sing that after the prayer. Brother Anthony. Let us pray. Our gracious, our kind, our loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning grateful, thankful. Father, we're thankful for this beautiful day that you've blessed us with. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity that you afford us. We're thankful for the measure of health that we have to be able to assemble. We do so in like-mindedness, in one body, one spirit. Father, we look to your word, we read, we study, and Father, we try to glean some understanding. And most importantly, we take what we learn, we take what we do, and we try to make proper application. Father, our hope is that when we go about our lives and, and we, we, we go amongst the, the other people in this world, that they would look upon us and they would see your presence. Father, we pray and we pray for much. We pray for many. Father, we know that your grace, your grace is sufficient. And you tell us, Father, that we have concerns and we have worries and we bring them to you. And that's what we do. Father, we pray for the sick. We pray for the afflicted. We pray for the struggling and the lost, the bereaved. We pray for those, Father, that are just less fortunate than ourselves. Father, we pray for your healing touch. We pray for your mending. We pray for your comfort. And we pray, Father, that you would just touch those that need touched. Father, you know every care. Father, you know every worry. Father, we pray for those that we instill our confidence in. 
people that we raise and we elect to those positions that make those decisions that affect us all. We pray for them, Father. We pray that they would rule wisely and justly, and may they always look to you. May they always seek your counsel. Father, we pray for those who that do our bidding and keep our, our laws and our peace. And, and, Father, we know that they so often put themselves in harm's way, and we pray for their safekeeping, those in our armed and our police forces, our medical personnel. Father, we pray for our church. We pray for our church family, friends of our church family. We know, Father, that there are needs, there are health complications, there are situations. We know that you know everyone. And we pray, Father, for all those involved. Father, we pray for our speaker of the hour, Brother Raymond. We pray that he would have a ready remembrance, a ready recollection of everything that, that he's prepared for us. And Father, we pray for ourselves. May we slow the pace of things down. May we forget the cares of the world for just a moment. Give him our attention. Uh, may we listen attentively, open hearts, open minds. And may something that is said here today stir us and have us uh, just give us a, a greater longing for thee. Father, go with us, be with us, lead us, guide us, direct us, forgive us. We fall short. It's in Jesus' precious and holy name that we pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen. If you'd like it, I'd like to ask you to stand while I sing this song, please. <clears throat> Sunlight all of my journey over the mountains to the deep Jesus has said, God, therefore, say, Here, promise you, blind that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory Two, please be seated. Number 272 will be our song of invitation, please. You might turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. What a bright day, beautiful day. Driving over today was just so nice. Walked out on the porch, it was just a bit below 60 degrees. And I thought, man, I wish I could get in that rocking chair and just kick back and drink another cup of coffee and look down the holler, you know. But good things will happen today. First of all, get to see all of you all. This is wonderful. And then 
I'll get to go back to Waterview, and we're going to have a potluck dinner this afternoon at the Marabone Park. And part of that is celebration of uh, just getting through the school year and being together, and I'm looking forward to it. And uh, get to see some people maybe I don't normally get to see. But today what I want to do, I want to talk about the family of God today. I want to talk about family. A lot of words in our culture are used kind of weird anymore. Uh, I know a lot of people try to run from their families. They don't want to be around their families. And I miss mine. I like being with mine. Even the ones that I, I don't like, I like being with them. Sometimes I don't like them, but I like being with them. Uh, I've got brothers and sisters all over the country, and when we get together, invariably, it, it's funny how when you get older, you don't remember the same things the same way. And some people have a, a different perspective of it. And I guess it's because some of us were older when all that was going on. Some of us were younger, maybe a little more cushioned from what really happened in life. But uh, I just love to listen to all the different viewpoints. And then one of my sisters said, I'm going to write a book about our family. I thought, oh, no. I thought, oh, no. I mean, it'll be a good book, but I don't know how much of it I'm going to agree with, but it'll be a good book. But anyway. In Ephesians 2, we read this, and I think it's just a beautiful picture. Verse 19, Now therefore you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Household means family. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now that verse covers so many angles of how that one can look at the people of God. I mean, you're looking at that everywhere from a temple to a nation, but specifically to the household of God, to God's family. You know, in this family, the idea is that we have a oneness together. I didn't have time for all this in the sermon, but I went through the Bible and I found so many verses that spoke uh, how that we look upon one another. I, I read in Hebrews 3 that we're to exhort one another and we're, avoid, we're to avoid being puffed up against one another in 1 Corinthians 4. James 5 says, don't begrudge one another the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 11, tarry for one another. 1 Corinthians 12, have the same care for one another. And I love James 5. He said, pray for one another. And do it as a family. Do it as people that really understand the concept of fellowship. Now, don't get me wrong. Getting together today and associating with each other, eating food, that's great. That's, that's wonderful. We do that every Sunday at our house anyway. Because, you know, Time is short, <clears throat> and the children that live close by, they come over, sit down at our table, and they eat with Granny, you know, and the, the girls all try to figure out how she cooked that. And, and they'll get it figured out one of these days because she's writing a cookbook for every one of them. They're all going to have her recipes. But the Bible tells us that fellowship is a little deeper deal. It, it is a relationship, and I want to say this, every one of you realize, as a Christian, None of us are natural born children of God like Jesus is. We are all adopted children of God. Now, I've had people tell me I, I don't believe in adoption. No, I, those children always fail. I just wonder if you don't understand you're an adopted child. I'm an adopted child. We were all adopted into the family of God. If you don't understand that, read Romans 8 and read Romans 9 and just really study it. And you're going to come to conclusion that we were allowed into the family of God, given a place, and fellowship is to be continued in. We've been called to fellowship. We are ministering in fellowship. There's always this concept. We're fellow citizens, fellow helpers, fellow servants, fellow workers, fellow heirs, fellow laborers, fellow prisoners, fellow soldiers. Wait a minute. You ever noticed in too many places, too many churches, people come together and they see each other for just a little bit and kind of like a lot of families today, they bust up and they don't connect 
They don't understand what's going on in people's lives. Actually, you're going to see later on that a lot of people in families just feel totally left out. I make a special effort in my work as a preacher, not just to go visit all the healthy, hardworking Christians in the church. They're busy. But I think about the older folks who are alone. I think about the old grandmas and grandpas that nobody checks on. And I like to go sit with them every now and then and just talk to them. I have had calls late at night from some person that was just so lonely. They just wanted to hear a human voice and had children. I think I told you all recently of a funeral I conducted. Three living sons and nobody came to the funeral. I couldn't believe it. And I thought, well, that kind of tells me something about that life. In Matthew chapter 23, the Lord said in verse 8, But you do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all, now catch this, brethren. That means brothers, sisters. We're a family. Can I ask you a question? Is your family happy? Most of the time, mine is. But when it's not, I can tell you what some of the root problems are. And that's what this lesson is about. It's about some of the things that hurt us in our families. Some of the things that hurt us. If there is one thing I do miss about my upbringing was the fact that back in those days, you know, if a child... One of the grandchildren ever tell me, what was it like in your day? The first thing I'm going to do is take their phone away from them. Then I'm going to take their earbuds away from them. And then I'm going to get them out of the bed about daylight. Then I'm going to show them what a field looks like that you have to haul hay in or drive a tractor or work. Then I'm going to show them that on your play day, they kicked you outside after breakfast and told you to show back up for lunch and, if, and then later on, just before supper, but make sure your hands were washed. It was a whole different world that I grew up in. I'm not saying that world would function today for a lot of young people. I'm not. They have to keep abreast of a lot of information and knowledge, but my world was different. So... One of the things, though, that stays consistent in all families in order for a family to function, and the church family is the same way. I, I like that because you all use that term a lot here. You talk about church family. Sean talked about church family. We need to talk about church family. But at the same time, the, the, what works in the personal family works in the church family, and usually what's going on in our personal families overrides into our relationship as the church family, and we therefore have either strengths or weaknesses because of that. First of all, to be successful as a family, we have to understand that there are expectations. Now, some people say, well, that, that's rules. That's what a rule is. And, and y'all know a lot of people don't like rules today. Y'all met those folks? They don't like rules. Well, they, they think that even in the church situation, that if you teach rules... That somehow or another you're, you're stifling uh, people's spirituality and their growth. And, but let that override into the home. You tell me a home that can function without expectations or rules. I don't know of any way for that to occur. I, I think there have to be rules. You know, uh, the Apostle Paul said this one time. I'm in 2 Corinthians 7. And I just want to read this to you. He said, if anything I boasted to him about you, I'm not ashamed. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, even so our boasting to Titus was found true. What do we boast about in family? Paul was boasting about this church. He said, Titus had really enjoyed his time with you. He said, he remembered the obedience of you all. How with fear and trembling you received him. I rejoice that I have confidence in you in everything. When you have confidence in a child, why do you have confidence in a child? Because you believe the child will do what? Will obey the rules that you've given that child in family. 
Now, how many of us give rules to our, our children to hurt them, to rob them of their happiness? They think we do sometimes. I, I've often thought about when the Lord gave the Ten Commandments, why did he give the Ten Commandments? And then one day, I remember something we did. The first home that we ever owned had, we had to build a fence around the yard because the road was fairly close. I mean, it's a good distance to the road. But the children loved to play. They got out in the yard and wanted to play all the time. And that was great. And, and we lived way back in the woods, but people come by fast. So I built a fence around the house. Now, why did I build that fence? Did I build it to uh, stifle my children? Absolutely not. I built it to give them freedom so they would know where they could go and be safe and where they could know they could go and, and meet my expectations on that matter and be safe. But a lot of people, when they read the Bible and think about God's will, or they hear rules at home, they think, you're trying to mess with me. You're trying to hold me back. Parents have to set limits and curfews and guidelines. They have to establish a family philosophy. Now, what are we telling our children when we tell them, just go where you want, do what you want, come back when you want? We're telling them, I don't care what you do. And that's such a destructive thing to insert into a child's mind. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The Lord doesn't play that game. The Lord expects all of us as the family to meet his expectations, and his expectations are the rules. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, after Paul had told some of the ladies, you need to be quiet because you're, you're disrupting assembly, and he also told the men to be quiet too if they, uh, if they didn't, couldn't keep the decorum. And both, both are addressed in the text. But in verse 37 he said, If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge, Paul said, that the things which I write to you, those things are the commandments of God. Now when we, when we teach the rules to people and, and we're trying to get people to come under the rule of Christ, we have to teach what the Lord says. All I am is a messenger boy. I am not the legislator. I am not the one that creates the rules. Now my children used to think that I was the rule creator. But as time went on, especially the Lord blessed them with their own children. I'm glad he did. Now they begin to realize what we feared, what we were afraid of, and why we said some of the things that we said to them was in order to give them a state of protection. But I will tell you this, no family is any more successful than it obeys its mother or father, and no church is any more successful than it obeys the truth. Somebody says, well, what about these families that have these abusive parents? What about these families or these church families that have abusive preachers and abusive elders? You still have to meet the expectations of what's right and good. I'm getting tired of people saying, because of the way I was raised, because of the way culture treated me, because of the fact that I wasn't born with a spoon in my mouth, because of, of the, the trauma I've gone through, I have a right to hurt you. I have a right to take, come on folks. Do we honestly think that what's going on in this country right now is a sign of the problem of a gun? Or is it the sign of the problem of young people, whether they had good parents or not, rebelling against what's right and what's good? And you know what it is. And it's bubbling to the surface all around us. The only place I know this is ever going to slow down is when we and our families take note of problems that our children have and begin early as we possibly can to address those problems with love, compassion, and expectations. I'll show you something in Scripture. When we reject the rules, we're literally rejecting the Lord. Um, in 2 Thessalonians, the Bible tells us that our, our state before the Lord is, is very strongly dependent upon uh, our relationship to the Lord. And he made, a, he made a statement here, and this is a very tough statement. Everybody listen closely. We command you, brethren, now this is not about what you do at home. This is about what you do in the church family. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and, and not according to the traditions which he received from us. Now, I think that's overplayed sometimes. But I will tell you this. The reason that Paul was concerned about somebody in the family walking disorderly, it destroys the authority and the rank and file of the church. It takes away from the agreement to be cohesive in obedience to the will of God. By the way, you know what the specific sin was that he committed there? See, a lot of people don't know. They think, well, he wasn't going to church because most churches only disfellowship people that don't show up. And that, that's what catches me off guard. Actually, what this guy was doing, he wouldn't work. Now, let me ask you a simple, very simple question. In the family, when you bring up a child that won't do what it's asked to do, are you training that child to be a contributor, whether to the church or to the place of work or to the culture of what's good and right? Are you training that child to be a user, a receiver, someone that expects the whole world to lay at its feet and do its bidding? You know. You know, I had a good friend and a lot of times he didn't get to do what some of us did. We'd go out and play basketball on a Saturday morning. We, we didn't sit in the house. We were constantly wearing ourselves out outside all day long. And that boy wanted to go with us, but his daddy was one of those guys that he would look around on a Saturday morning and everything would look good. The farm looked good. Everything, the yard was mowed. He'd find something for that boy to do to work. And one day he told that boy, he said, listen here, he said, when you grow up, and you get out on your own, and if you don't have to work, then you can quit working. But while you're with me, you will learn what it means to work. I always thought that was strange, that the sin that the church disfellowshiped this guy over was he wouldn't work. He wouldn't, he wouldn't provide his own brand. You see what I'm saying? He wouldn't take responsibility for himself. And it extrapolates to a, a, a very large spot. Uh, he was out of rank on that. Well, our rules of conduct are very simple. A family cannot be successful without order. You know, around the home, if you've got several children, there's got to be work. What about at meals, ladies and gentlemen? Have you ever noticed how we, we don't demand or we don't expect a certain obedience at meals? We don't gather up for them anymore. It's a special occasion to do what you're going to do this afternoon. And in my time, it wasn't. You want to eat a bite of food, guess where you had to be? At the table with all the other brothers and sisters. There was a togetherness in that. What about, what about support? You know, moms and dads had to work even back then. I know that. But I'm going to tell you, in some families, moms and dads and their children had to work, especially if you was in a farm situation or you didn't have any money or food. Decent lives were an expectation. Now, a lot of kids, I, I'll tell you what a lot of kids did back in my day. They slipped around to be ugly. They didn't flaunt it. They didn't, they didn't manage to get the agreement of their parents that I'm going to go out and party tonight. And Well, honey, if you do, just make sure if you need me and you can't drive back home, I'll come and get you. I understand that. But let me tell you, in my day, you didn't, you didn't announce something like that to your parents or you would never get out the door alive. And you dreaded coming home if they caught you because there was going to be a reckoning. Is anybody understanding what I'm saying? There needs to be rules. Second thing, successful families <laughs> have to have some forbearance and patience. Man, I'll tell you something I just don't like. See a young parent that's so frustrated with children, or, and the same thing can flow into the church, but let me show you. They're so frustrated with children that they're always smacking their mouths and jerking their arms. Now, there's something wrong with that picture. We weren't just, we weren't just beat up because our parents were just mad and angry and put out. We were punished. But there was an announcement that it was going to occur and there was an explanation of why it was going to occur. It wasn't just a knee-jerk reaction of some angry parent who felt that they had been shamed in a public situation. 
Matter of fact, I think some churches do this. I think some churches only disfellowship people, not because they tried to restore them, tried to teach them, tried to discipline, but they just got ashamed. Matter of fact, we use that term. You brought shame on the church. Have you ever heard that? So now we're going to kick you out. That's it. You might as well smack their mouth and jerk their arms for all the good it's going to do. No, I tell you, and most people my age will tell you this, we dreaded the talk worse than we did the whipping. The talk was going to be bad and lengthy. Sometimes we'd just rather take the whip. I remember one little girl uh, at where I used to preach years ago. Her mama was big on talking to her. But Randall McPherson told me, he said, well, I preached to her too. He said, uh, I got the notice and she'd get up and go outside and start playing. She'd say she's sick. And she'd go outside and start playing. And said one day, said she went outside, so he said, I, I told her mama, said, your little girl just went outside, I think she's sick. Well, she went out there, and he said, I heard some fussing out there and talking. Then he said, I heard, get back in there. Well, later on, he said, a few weeks went by, and said, something serious happened to church. And he said, I was having to preach a lesson that was really you know, hard, and, and everybody was edgy, and, and there was just, you know, this absolute, almost like everybody held their breath for 30 minutes. You, you've been in a place when something like that's going on. Well, well, he said, she's sitting there looking around. The tension was getting palpable, and she said, she finally just reached a point. She looked around, and she said, well, Mama, just take me outside and whip me. I can't stand this. <laughs> the talk was getting to her. But we do have to show this. I, I, I think about new babies. Would you criticize constantly or, 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 or punish a little baby when it's first stumbling at its, its first steps or it spilled food while learning to eat or, or being fearful of the dark or fearful of some new task that you ask it to do? No, surely you wouldn't. You would try to explain. You would try to show love and and uh, loving parents, older brothers, older sisters would patiently correct and guide and teach with a lot of reputation. That's how you grow. Now, again, let me be very plain about it. You want to be a family here. You want to grow as a family. You got to spend some time talking to each other. Too many times we come into church when it's over. I say, I don't get to see y'all when it's over. So I can blindly say what I'm going to say. Everybody takes off and nobody talks to each other. By the way, if you show up to Waterview, you better stand in the yard for a while. They're going to think you're weird after church is over. They all going to stand out there, and I don't think they will today because they're going to go home, and get their food, and head for the park. But you talk. You encourage. You make comments. You, you try to help guide people. Um, and sometimes... Listen to me closely. You explain the rules to people. Did you catch that? You ever have people come into church services that were inappropriate but they didn't know any better? Sometimes you have to help them. I remember a gentleman many years ago, and I mean this is like 50 years ago. He was a foster care parent and uh, his name was Pruitt and he lived up in Washington County. And he had this little rule, and the reason I know it, I, I was very young, and I sat and listened to him talk to some of the older people, and, and he would have six or seven kids a lot of times in his home. Some of them would be big old boys and girls. And, man, they just loved him over a period of time. And he said one time he had this big old boy come in, a great big old heavy set boy, big strong boy, 13 years old but bigger than Nathan. And he said, on the first night that we had a new kid in the home, at our house, he said, we would all gather around the table. He said, I'd sit at the head, my wife sat at this end, and all the children sat and said, there was that big boy sitting up pretty close to me. And he said, I would start with the first child and say, would you tell so-and-so the rules of the house? And they would each begin to speak about the rules of the house. And each child would explain the rules of the house all the way around the table. And the idea was, for the newcomer to realize you need to learn the rules of the house because all the kids have learned the rules of the house. Well, he said, I watched the boy and I could tell he was turned off by the whole thing. He, he, was, he didn't even want to listen to it. Later on, they got into a war. He, he and that boy did. And that boy about got him and he attacked him physically. He had been attacking 
the, the dominant figures in the homes that he'd been in. So he attacked him. And you got to know Mr. Pruitt. He reached over and there was a little old little wooden bat there and he picked it up and he pecked him on the head with it, you know. I mean, that's how they did you back then. If you wanted to put up a big fight, you'd pay a price for it. Big court hearing and all that stuff. And when it was all said and done, they exonerated Mr. Pruitt. And uh, the, the judge was getting ready to send the boy to a different home. And Mr. Pruitt said, wait a minute. No, no. He said, I didn't come here to get rid of him. So I only come here because you all told me I had to. He said, I want him to go back home with me. Well, if I'd have been that boy, I'd have been going, mm-hmm, all righty, we'll see how that's going to work. But he took him back home. They let him go back. They respected him that much. And, and, and the sad part about a story like that is this. A lot of these young people in, who, are, who are in a foster home and uh, would love to be adopted and never get adopted. And they call, they call that aging out. And he aged out of that program. Well, he was gone. Mr. Pruitt said one time, he said, I was sitting out the house, and he said, all of a sudden, I heard a car honk, honk, horn, honk. So I looked out, and there said this big old pretty car sitting out there. And said, this man got out and said, big, tall, stout-looking fella. And there was a young lady sitting there just a smiling, kind of waving at me. And then he said, he walked up, and he said, it was that boy. This is like seven or eight years had gone by. And he said, that boy, said, Mr. Pruitt, he said, I've got married. He said, I'm living in another place. I've got a good job. And he said, I want to introduce you to my wife. And Mr. Pruitt said, well, please bring her up. He said, i got one question to ask you, though, before I do it. He said, me and you had some troubles, didn't we? He said, you was the only one that ever stood to me and told me no. He said, now, I need to ask you a very simple question. He said, what is it? He said, can I introduce you to my wife as my daddy? Did you know the Bible says that in the family of God, we have many fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters if we do it right? Don't we need to do it right? Don't our children need to look at people like me and say, that's my pa." At church, my grandma. The third thing, in order for this to occur, successful families have to be loyal and have to have care for one another. <laughs> Many times when we go out, sometimes I think, oh, these boys are going to grow up and they're going to hate each other worse than anything I ever saw because they were so competitive and fight all the time. We'd go through a, a bank and they'd be giving out suckers and balloons and one of the boys would be sitting there beside him and, he'd, and I'd get ready to pull away. They'd already give him a sucker and a balloon. He'd say, wait a minute. He said, can you give me two or three more? So I got some brothers at home. And he wanted them to have something. And I'd think, ah, you're going to go home and fight with them. And then it, then it hit me. This, this concept that we have about family, it's never going to be perfect. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be rubbing of elbows the wrong way. We all are going to do that. But that should never, never belie the fact that we love each other and care for each other and are loyal to each other. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there's a scriptural precedent that goes like this. There should be no division in the body, but the members should have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Ergo, you all meet today to honor the students that have transitioned into the next step of life. He said, you're the body of Christ. Members individually. Everybody should see the body of Christ as the family. What worries me a bit in the culture we live in today is that this general concept that we should see as a natural outpouring of family has been eroded quite a bit in our culture. There are many children, number one, they never, they never really get to know their mothers and fathers, or not, not at least not both at the same time in a loving relationship. And there are many churches that people, they never get connected up with each other, like, just like such a family as that. And it's very difficult. And uh, I, I had invited a, a lady to services in the community, 
and uh, she she was a teacher that she had taken a leave of absence, and she said, I, I, I'm going to try to come. It's, it's going to be me and my little girl. She said, I, we're going through divorce. And I'm sorry for that lady, terribly sorry for her. And, and I said, well, please come. You need us now more than ever. She's not a member of the church. But I said, you need to come. You need us. People need this. People need to realize that that if family dissolves, that there's a way to have a family. There's a passage in Philippians 2 that I like. And Paul said in verse 19, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly that I also may be encouraged when I know your state, your true condition. Now watch what he said. I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. The word sincerely means genuinely. Some some passages say naturally care for your state. He said, for all seek their own and not the things of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. What are you hearing all that? Paul said, I can't come, but I'm going to send someone that's like a son to me who will genuinely care for you. And he's going to teach you and help you to understand what God's will is. My question, I guess, now comes. When David said in Psalms 142, verse 4, and he was in a very sad state of depression, he said, no one cares for my soul. No one cares for my soul. Are you first of all in a private family where no one cares for each other? Please don't say yes. Is this a church that doesn't care for each other? Please don't say yes. Because I have learned in the culture we're in right now, that's one of the strongest social elements that we can have is to know that someone really cares about me. Now I know that God cares, the Holy Spirit cares. I know that, that Jesus Christ cares. That, that is easily provable in the very plan of salvation, but do we care? Do we care? Do we care enough that we show a loyalty to people, even when people are making mistakes and, and hurting? I realize that my primary care and loyalty is toward the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know, the Bible says, ye that are spiritual, in Galatians 6, 1, when you see someone struggling, you restore them in the spirit of meekness. You consider yourself, lest you be tempted to be hard-hearted. He went on to say that there are a lot of burdens that we all have to bear. I can't take all your burdens from you, but I can help you. I can be there beside you. Sometimes all I can do is just sit and keep my mouth shut. But you would realize, well, he cares. She cares. They care. And it's sometimes just that one little light of showing someone you care that may save their life. Did you know that? That one person that gets to a state of darkness so deep that if just one person shows that they care, they might feel like they have a reason to live. Otherwise, it might be their last day on earth. What is that like to die believing nobody cares for you? Nobody loves you. And especially nobody in your family. You see, that's what a real successful family is about, whether we talk about it at home or church. Now listen closely. We love and we forgive. We love, we love and we forgive. I, I guess... Every family in this room, there's never been a problem, right? Nobody's ever made a mistake, right? (laughs) I know I can't say that in mine. Let me read this verse to you. You've heard the verse, but, but I want you to hear it in the context of this lesson. Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in Him. If God is glorified in Him, God will also glorify Him in Himself and glorify Him immediately. A lot of glory, little children. I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, as I said to the Jews, where I'm going. You cannot come, so now I say to you. Now think all of that. 
But the Lord said, I'm going to leave. I think that was setting a very depressed tone to the, the disciples. They didn't want him to go. But he said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I've loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you're my disciples. Ye have loved one for another. One of the very most very important statements that the Lord ever made on which all the law and the commandments hinge seems to be one of the hardest problems that we have naturally allowing to happen among us. Loving each other, forgiving each other, caring about each other. It seems so strange to me that, that as Christians we even have to really preach about this, but we do. And such love is always expressed in forgiveness. You know, years ago a fellow told me a story about, and I don't know where this fellow preached, but he wasn't in this state, but he was a good preacher and everybody knew he was a good preacher. And time went on, there was a meeting going to be held at that church and you learn a lot of stuff in, in gospel meetings. That's probably one of the things I miss about kind of retiring from that circuit like I did not long back, but is just traveling all over the country and meeting different brethren and, and learning about what's going on in, in their town and their county and their state and that kind of thing. But the fellow that was telling the story said as he pulled up, he went past the preacher's house, which was fairly close to the church house. He looked out and he saw in the yard <coughs> a little girl playing. And he went, oh, well. And he thought, I didn't know that he, he had a little girl. And, and he said, I, I, I didn't know that, that uh, his child had gotten married. But he went on down, got down there, and the people gathered up for the first night of the meeting. So he went on back home with the old preacher. And he said, explain to me the little girl. He was kind of laughing, you know. And he said, well, it's a long story, but he said, I'll tell it to you. He said, my daughter got pregnant. Oh, now that's hard on preachers. It's hard for brethren to forgive the preacher for something like that. How, how, how come you didn't have perfect control over your child? Don't you think he didn't ask that question to himself? He said, I went to the church and I told the church I need to resign. He said, my daughter's got pregnant, going to have a baby. That all the men were sitting there, one of those kind of business meetings that you just really don't want to be at, but you got to be there. And he said, I, I'm going to leave. He said, I don't want to hurt the church. And he said, this one old fellow got up and he said, preacher, and he said, you never could really figure this guy out because... He was always so studious and his brow would knit like mine's doing right now and, and you would think he was angry but he said, preacher, he said, you know, you've been here quite a while. He said, you've married our children. You've buried our parents. You've helped us to convert people to Christ. When we would show out and act like fools, you'd stand there and try to call us together. And he said, and now that you need us, you're going to leave us? He said, what's that about? Why would you even think about leaving us when now we can help you? That's family. You heard the old joke? The fellow had a bad son that was doing bad things, but he loved him. His friend said, you know what? That was my son. I'd kick him out. Remember what the old man said? If that was your son. I'd kick him out too, but it ain't. It's mine. And he's family. And I'm going to love him and do my best to help him. <laughs> well, yes, we have rules. We're going to break them probably. We need to be patient. We got to grow. But we need to be loyal to our, each other. And we need to love each other and forgive each other. But now let me ask you a question. How do you get into the family? Well, I told you we were adopted, but our adoption is accomplished by a spiritual new birth. We have to be born of water and the Spirit, according to John 3. That birth process starts with faith in Christ. We turn away from our sins and we confess Him and then we're baptized into Him. 
And it's just like a brand new birth. Oh, it's not that we are totally ignorant of our past and we forgot it. We can't. I wish I could tell you you could, but you can't. I'd be lying to you. But the bottom line is we have a new direction of purpose and heart. We want to serve the Lord. We want him to be our father. We want Jesus as our brother. We want the Holy Spirit as our mentor. We want the brethren to be our family. And when we make our mistakes, we want help. We need help. But we have to be born again for that to start. So if you're in this room and you're not a Christian, I can give you so many good reasons to become one. But I think one of the best ones, besides salvation, is you can have a family that will really strive to help you for eternity. Well, you think about it. Let's stand up and sing. Be seated, please. Before we take the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 95, please. <clears throat> Days are filled with sorrow and care, hearts are lonely and drear, but inside the are filled with sorrow and care.
This time we partake of the Lord's Supper. If you would, if you could turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 11th chapter, beginning in verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I have delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed it, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, also he took the cup, and when he had uh, supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do as often as you do, you drink it, you drink it in the remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. That's very important, to show the death till he comes. Our Father, we're very thankful to you that we have a Savior and that we have Jesus who came to this earth and was born and lived and died and gave his life and suffered on the cross for our sins. Help us if we partake of this bread, we might do so in a way that would be pleasing to you, always remembering our Savior Jesus and the help that he provides for us as we enter and go from this life into heaven. We pray and ask in Christ's name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we're thankful to you for the fruit of the vine. To Christians, it reminds us of the Jesus' blood that was shed on Calvary for our sin. That his blood will cleanse us from our sins. Keep on cleaning as long as we live in the light of the Lord. Help us to do these things in a way to be pleasing to you. Please forgive us. We ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen. Turn to number 250, where that'll be our final song. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 5 of that song. We're very, very fortunate to have Brother Raymond with us. I'm just, he just, his lessons are so good, and every every week he brings he brings us a, a, a new lesson, a good lesson, and we're just extremely fortunate that he's able to work with us. Let's stand while we sing. Sweet and heavenly is the sight when those that love the Lord and one another's peace, delight, and souls fill the world. When free from envy, scorn, and pride, our wishes are above. Each can his brother's pray. Let us pray. Our most glorious Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to come before you today where we've sang songs of praise. We've listened to your word and we've studied your word. Father, thank you for the most powerful message that Brother Raymond brought forth today. And let us take this message to heart and apply it to our lives each and every day as we move forward. Father, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. We appreciate this so and take it so for granted. Father, forgive us of our sins. Father, watch over those that were made mention of today in today's service and help them to resolve their issues and improve their health. 
Father, watch over those that serve and protect us each and every day. Father, we pray that this country gets back on the path for your directions and your guidance, and we become better. Father, once again, let's take this message today and apply it to our lives. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Test.